Let's do it. What do you think, guys? You want to do it? Let's do it. Get your mic on. Yep. I got my mic on, yep. yep. Let's get this live. Right. <laughs> there we are. All right. Welcome. We got a crew in here. Look at this. Linda Snow. Welcome, Linda. And welcome to Snook, our newest member. Bravo. Appreciate it. Billy Bob Blog. Dan Pittman. Patrick Paulson. Look at this. All the all the good old boys are here. Psycho Plant Lady. And William What If. Joe Sneed. Stacy Green. Who's Sandra Crumb? Hello, Sandra. And still love it, but Purge is back. Mythis Factory. Let me get a couple of wrenches out of here. Sandra, it, you um, turn you blue. And Steel Law. Hello, Steel. Good to see you. Hello. Another wrench. Yuri. Yuri. Yuri Gaming, who is this? Sandra Steele, Yuri. Hello, Yuri. Bunch of new people. Now make sure you do, guys, that you that you uh, subscribe to the channel, or you won't be able to keep your uh, your reg. You won't be able to keep your moderator status. It will drop off between now and the next video if you are not subscribed. Nick Nick Binkowski. Hello, Nick. Nice to see you. Good to have you here. What happened there? It removed him as a moderator. Oh. <laughs> yes. Did it and took it away and put it back. It there you canceled. go. Add moderator. Standard moderator. Oh, right. Don't cancel. Oh, yeah, right. Look at that. Clicking on the wrong button. Uh, Mark, 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 Jemison, Jemison, Jemmy, Jemison, I guess. Let me get Mark a wrench. Bunch of new people. Nice to see you all. Peace Love Puppies is here. Nick Binkowski. Dan's too godly. Just got a red tail black shark. They are cool. That is a neat fish. Got to agree. And they don't get real big either. Bobby Kaisi. Uh, Cassie Kaisi. Staring at your tank. Nice to see you, Bobby. I get you a wrench. I'm just I'm I'm pausing here because I have got wrenches to all the new people. Turtle at it. <laughs> here to see more of the father fish typical nets. Well, you got it. There it is. We got it right there, right there, right there. There it is. Let's see. Who else? Christine Spencer. Want to do a plant tank? Bravo. You need to get over on the show. Get to the Discord channel. That's going to be the best way to get help. Well, any support you need to be able to do that. Uh, Ruben Ubasa. Ruben, hello, hello. Good to see you. My old and new folks. We just... We, we hit something right, didn't we? Nick, hello, Nick, and Mark Jameson. Wait, you got your wrench quick, Mark. Teresa Clark. Now, make sure, all you who are getting wrenches, make sure you sign up as subscribers to the Father Fish channel. Otherwise, you will lose your wrench. You're a newbie. Trisha, nice to see you, Trisha. Silver Fox from the UK. Hello, Silver Fox. Goodness sakes. Leanne Stokes. 
Gandalf is here. I want you to know. Where'd Gandalf go? There he is. Leon Stokes. New here, but willing to learn. Well, we're willing to teach. So we'll see. We'll see how all that works out. Huh? Chloe. Well, you're a long 20. <laughs> it's in my home. I'm in my studio. Uh, we rented a warehouse to be able to do pack out for our plant business. And it has a little office in the front. So we're converting that into a studio, which will have a lot of fish tanks in it. Eventually, a whole lot of fish tanks. Um, and I may wind up moving the 22 over here. We'll have to wait and see how that goes. I am getting shelves built, so that may be possible. Brian Smith, thank you for your $5 super chat. Set up my first planted, thanks to you. Use your plant pack. And after a week, they're already growing like weeds. They do indeed. Isn't it great? They do so well. There was another somewhere up here. Where did it go? That's funny. What is this? Is that the same one? That's Cassandra McDonald. That's a different, and it didn't show up. Let's see if it's on the screen. Brian Smith. It's up twice. That's funny. Brian. Good. Excellent. Good job, Brian. Thank you. And thank you for the super chat. That's very kind. And Mark, oh, this is what the other was. It was a uh, a new snook, Mark Jamelson. Jamelson. Welcome, Mark, and thank you for the 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 newest new member. Good to see you, Fish Family. Hello, Fish Family. Nick Minkowski, Jonathan Poole from New England, Jonas McGee. Where can I order plants from you? Says Nick. Um. Go to fatherfish.fish, www.fatherfish.fish, um, and you will find the link to the store right at the top of the page. Just click on the store, and it'll take you right there, and you'll be able to order. Mark Jameson, who is this now? Um, to track what I'm doing here. Became a YouTube member. Welcome, Mark. Good job. As a snook. Let's see. Fish on Lake, Mark Jameson, Sandra Cron. Where am I located? Uh, I'm in Salisbury, Maryland, which is about a half an hour from the Atlantic coast. Uh, specifically Ocean City and Assateague Island. Assateague is a, a federal reserve. That's where the ponies are uh, in Assateague. It's a, a huge, long um, barrier island on the coast of the Chesapeake Bay on the, on the Atlantic coast. Payne family ordered my father fish, dirt, and plants. Last week, waiting for them to ship. They will ship this week, pain. Won't be long. Let's see. What am I doing here? Got to get you a wrench. There it is. There it is. Okay. Oh, Boston. Mark is in Boston. Andrew Fenno saw a YouTube video this week that said water changes aren't just needed to remove ammonia and nitrates, but also for young fish to grow as they need fresh water. Have you heard this before? Oh, I did, I, indeed I have, Andrew. Um, there, that's kind of a mixed bag. Um, there's some truth and some things that are just not true. 
remove using water change to remove ammonia um, is uh, is like trying to bail out a boat with a hole in it. It doesn't accomplish anything because whatever is causing the ammonia is not being dealt with. It's still going to produce ammonia. You need to deal with the source of the ammonia. And the best way to do that is the same way as dealing with the source of nitrates, which is to add more plants to the tank. Plants absorb both ammonia and nitrates almost immediately. They take them up very quickly. If you have your tank half full of plants, you will not have ammonia and you will not have excess nitrates. Excess nitrates, however, are not nearly the problem that ammonia can be. There are different kinds of ammonia problems. Generally, in an older tank or a more established tank, a tank with plants, ammonia is never a problem. And it's never anything that is even a consideration. Okay, so that's ammonia nitrate. The other part is the young fish. Farmers do water changes with young fish daily. The reason they do that is because those young fish are in a bare tank. There is nothing in that tank to reduce pollutants, to reduce any of the gases, any of the organics, nothing. And they're being fed very, very heavily. So there's considerable waste and considerable excess food, which means that that water is on the verge of fouling on a daily basis. So by purging it, by taking it out, replacing it with new water on a routine daily basis, they maintain the clarity and purity of the water. Another part of that research indicates that doing that allows the fish to grow more rapidly. It reduces the stress on the baby fish which allows it to grow more naturally and more, more normally. So there's, there's some truth in that, but it's kind of convoluted. The reality is in your aquarium, brand new water is substantially more dangerous than old water. Old water contains a balance that has been created in that aquarium between the organic population, the fish, plants, and other organic material, and the water itself, and the, the, the chemistry of the water that brings it into balance, into harmony. So old water tends to be vastly more harmonious. This is what we understood 50 years ago. And for a hundred years before that, water was never changed. From the time fish were kept in aquariums, from about 1856, when flat glass was first invented and aquariums were first created, the same time window panes began to exist, you know, glass window panes, as, as opposed to, what is that other material called isinglass? If you know what isinglass is, it's a mineral that is peeled very, very thin and was used uh, in glass windows. It was also used uh, in automobiles as the, uh, uh, as the front, what's that front class called? Windshield. No, there's another word for it not windshield. Anyway, um, isinglass is one of the first materials that were used. 
I guess for side windows, you really can't see through it. It lets light in, but it distorts too much to be able to see through. So it was not used as that uh, screen. Well, I don't remember. Anyway, um, flat glass in, in the early tanks. The earliest tanks had water put in them. That water was never changed. They also put dirt in them. In the earliest tanks, there was dirt in the bottom. They had plants growing in them. The very first tanks that were developed were developed as natural tanks. That was before electricity. There was no filtration. There were no heaters. There was no light. So they had to create as natural uh, an environment as possible in order to keep things alive. It wasn't until marketing strategy began to develop in the 60s claiming that maintaining a clean tank was a requisite of, of having a healthy tank. That was the point where brand new water every day, chemicals in the water to kill everything, that was where that started in roughly the 60s, toward the mid-60s, actually. Uh, and then it, it, uh, it just, it, it, <laughs> it, it became worse and worse to the point that we are now fighting that tooth and claw. And I, I should say winning the battle against it because it is creating tanks that kill fish routinely. It is why 90% of the people who get into the hobby drop out because that technology doesn't allow fish to live and thrive in it in, in a natural, healthy way. It, it keeps them in, in a, a, a very synthetic environment that does not have the ability to provide the natural kinds of organics that fish need to be able to survive. And part of that, a some significant part of that, is aged water. Old water is able to maintain more, more biological material, more, uh, more biomass, able to sustain in a healthy way more biomass than brand new water. So by changing your water out, you're, you're, you're creating a stress environment in the tank in which the biomass that your tank is used to is no longer able to cope with it in the way it has been, and that has to play catch up. And that can take a while, and that causes stress on the fish. More fish die during water changes than at any other single time in the history of an aquarium. If you have an aquarium set up for five years and you're doing water changes every week or every month and you go back and look, you'll find that virtually every fish that died, died immediately following a water change. There is a reason for that. And it doesn't have to do with something was in the water. It has to do with taking out something that was in the water from the water, in the water, as the water, and replacing it with new water that did, not, that, that did not have that something in it. And that something is organic material. And I don't know how to say this exactly. That's not going to blow the heads off some people. Electromagnetic material that helped to maintain the balance of the system chemical material, if you will, naturally created in the tank in order to sustain its balance. You see, what happens in an aquarium is that more and more organics are put in it. That causes the, 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 uh, the structure of the tank, the structure of the aquarium 
through its plants, its water, its soil, every aspect of it to increase its biological uh, capability, its load, if you will. By incre it increases its ability to sustain an increased load to the point where it will continue to increase literally year after year. Natural aquatics, natural aqu aquarium, a brand new channel just came up online. It is, he has a tank that's 33 years old. 33 years. It's 10 years older than my tank. It is a dirted tank. He set that tank up 33 years ago as a dirted tank, sand cap dirted tank. It is maintaining a volume of life that I've never seen before. It, it is absolutely astounding. The, the sheer volume of biological material living in that tank, it is a hundred times more than probably most of us have alive in our tanks. The tank has developed the ability to sustain that volume of life. And it did not happen by changing the water, quite the reverse. It happened by not changing the water and allowing the environment to develop and to nurture and to become the rich, strong, powerful environment that it is. That is a, that, 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 what I just said is an absolute opposition to everything that is being taught in the industry today in the hobby. That's the nature of what we're about here. We are coming out against the entire aquatic industry's approach, a killer approach to maintaining aquariums. It is rare to the point of non-existent that there is a single manufacturer or producer of aquarium products that has any interest at all in maintaining and sustaining a natural aquarium. For the very simple reason that sick fish sell products. And the industry is about selling products, not keeping fish alive. The sicker the fish, the more money the industry makes selling chemicals and additives and medications and all of that in order to keep those sick fish going, which they don't do, of course. They die. Which, again, is the reason 90% of the people who, who get into this hobby with the idea of having an aquarium with some fish in it. They bring that home, they set it up, the fish, they do everything they're told to do, and the fish die. They go back, they get more fish, more stuff, more chemicals, dump it in there, the fish die. They may do it a third time. And the fish die. At that point, they have a choice. 90% of them will make the choice to, to empty the tank and put it out on the curb. Who is this? Andre. Wonderful. Hold on. Don't go away. Andre. You're in. Okay, go ahead. Do you have the link? I sent it by email. Yeah, it's on all that. I was just setting up the background and trying to work the camera. Okay, as soon as you're ready, just jump on in and I'll bring you up. I'm, I'm you're, already here. I'm already your stuff. Okay. You're not in. No. Okay, so no. Okay, 
click on the link and it took you to it to, you've got a there when you click on the link what happened yeah let me see what's going on there because i gotta log in and all that oh right yeah once you get there then you have to go through a couple of steps Good, do that. There you are. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> there we are. There he is. Sorry. Man of the hour. Let no, not really. To you. Say that again. I'm going to introduce you. We are live. Oh, we're live. We got, how many okay. people we got, John? Uh, 131. We got 130 people in right now. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, on. get in the middle of the screen. You're 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 off to the side. There we are. Great. This is Andre Ryan. Uh, there we go. Got it. Right. There Roll he is. The other way. Andre owns Bioaquatics in uh, in in uh, Sarasota, Florida. He's an old friend. We've known each other for years and years and years. Yeah. Keep counting. Twenty, 20 something years. Maybe. 20, 20, 27. Yeah, probably. Yeah, since John Fisher's farm. Oh, yeah. I think I met you there, I think. Yeah, yeah that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. Right. Happy to see you. Welcome. Oh, good to see you. I see you shaved yourself. You know, I did. I did. You, know, I did. you haven't anymore. seen me solve beers. Huh? Andre is one of the top fish breeders uh, in I the country. That, <laughs> well, I think you <laughs> are. <laughs> I just he like sends things fish. nobody else has done. He will, he will, re, he will select the fish, research that fish in detail, and learn how to not just maintain it, but how to get it to spawn. And he's done it. He's been doing it for years. Just really remarkable. You're in. You, what, what's that in your background? What are we looking at? Oh, it's just a tank. There? I took a picture because right now the background is the living room and it doesn't look that good. <laughs> Right. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. I, I, yeah, I go to the building and stuff. That. I, I go to the building, but, you know, it's kind of raining right. today. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so you're not out in your in your fish room today. No, I don't know. Uh, he's got a little this? farm. Can I use uh, this on the phone? You're okay. Yeah, it's, I'm good. You know, I'm I good. Think, yeah. It's bleeding a little, but it's not a problem. Right, and I, I don't have great connection right now, so I got it. They said it to use we it can, with wire. We your shiny face. Uh, right. Just before you came up, I was going off on on the uh, on the industry and their anti fish mentality. Well, th there's always something going on. Uh, I think the the biggest thing that's happening in the industry is that there's less and less producers out in the, in Florida that they used to be. Uh, just because well, that's true, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and and it's a uh, it's it's happening pretty quickly, and you know a lot of the old timers are retiring, and the uh, the land is worth a lot of money, so they they tr you know really nobody gets in the fish business to make money, you know they do it because because uh, they enjoy well, not it. Not anymore, not anymore. Right. Well, as a producer, it, it's not easy. You know, I mean, it's a different story if you're a streamer or if you, like you do YouTube videos or. You do things that oh, you show off your tank, or you're an importer or a broker. Yeah, the, you know, okay, the web would work pretty well, but as a as a producer, uh, you know, you 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 can't sell what you produce as much on the web because there's no way, unless you have millions of clients, you you you, you need the wholesalers and the distributors and the stores to sell your stuff. You know, so and so so you know, the, the web doesn't make a lot of money for us breeders. You know, it, it makes a little percentage of it, but most of our income comes from selling to the bigger, you know, distributors and stores or whatever that are regular, you know, regular customers. And uh, so what happened, a lot of these farmers, when they uh, they want to sell out or something like that, nobody really gets into it because it's a lot of work and it's uh, physical work. And, uh, you know, the return on investment is very low. For all the time you put in breeding, you know, unless your farm is really cheap, but most people, you know, farmers that sell their land are not going to sell it for a hundred thousand dollars. You know, they got to get millions, and so it's the land that's worth more than the farm, you know. So and then developers take it, and then 
you know, nobody wants to inherit a farm and then get to work, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, you could play a little bit, but, you know, to really be a producer, you know, you need to produce lots and lots of numbers. Like an example, if I, if when I get going on a, on a Petrocola or something like that, I can produce about 20, 20,000 a year, probably, maybe 25,000. There's no way I can sell 25,000 on the web by itself. <laughs> it's not possible. Right, right, you know, I mean, right. most customers will, uh, will buy one. Well, not most, you know, like a, a percentage of customers will buy one or four or five. And, and yet, yeah, you get, you know, more money for it. But in overall, the price of the fish, you know, distributors is like $2, right? So they'll buy a thousand or, you know, 500, yeah. 500. So you go through them pretty good. But if I was waiting for, you know, I sell, I sell maybe 50 a month online. So it's, wow. it's I'll never get rid of them, you know, if I do that. Right. So, I have to use the distributors. I have to use the stores, the local stores, the stores up north, whatever, California, whatever. And, but, you know, like anything else, uh, yeah, everybody's excited to be breeding fish, but, you know, I can't breed just a few fish, you know? And so, uh, like years ago, I used to do a galaxies. I'm getting back into it, but about 10 years ago, I used to do the Celestial Danios, CPDs or whatever they call them now. <clears throat> and it was you know, probably a couple of years after they were introduced and then, I think I built the stocks up and uh, the year I sold it pretty good. I think I had 50,000. So I sold 50,000 in a year, but at the time I didn't have the web. So it was just a local store, right. you know, so I was averaging about 50 cents on average. So even though you produce 50,000, that's like 20 grand, you know? So it's not like you're rolling in money or something like that. It's a lot of work for that little fish. So to, to get rid of them and, so but now if I do them again, then now it's a little more interesting. I still have to sell them distributors. I'm not going to try to sub little colonies of 25 and just collect, you know, dozens of right. eggs. Here. I got to set up thousands of them to make it uh, worth my time, right? Because as a breather, uh, time is a, is essential for anything else. Like if I did angel, when I do angelfish and I get, get back into blues or, uh, you know, red back angelfish or something like that, I'm not going to set up one pair, right? I'm going to set up like 40 pairs. Of blues and 20 pairs of this and so i'm not gonna produce like a couple of hundred fish you know I gotta, i'm gonna produce a lot <laughs> right right so there's no way i can sell that online you know it's not possible so uh, yeah it's cool you know and i can do videos and stuff like that but the return is not there the return is the, the, tur the turnover right so if, when i sell angels to distributors they'll buy like five thousand a clip right even if they're 50 cents well that's twenty five hundred dollars you know so you know, you do that every week, you know, you got a good, good return. You know. But uh, if I just waited for the, the, my internet business to catch up on those fish, by the time I sell them, you know, they'd be like giant fish. <laughs> so, right. Right. But you no, know, it's just, that's what it is, is, is we live in a society where the cost of living is, is high. So it's really hard to be a breeder here. It costs too much money. Aquaculture has been leaving the country at all levels, food, fish, and crustaceans. And, you know, the only one that's making money is, is, is the corals right now, is what I see uh, as a small scale, right? You can, a lot of guys in a garage or basements are doing corals because they can sell little pieces, little fragments right. for good money. Right. And uh, the labor is very little, you know, it's not like you're there sanding ponds and cutting grass and, uh, you know, feeding, you know, 50 pounds of food every day, you know, so it's small amounts, a small surface, but the, the, the surface area is very small and your return is high, right? Have so, you thought about getting into saltwater? Uh, yes, I first got into this business because I wanted to get in saltwater, but the problem is it is in Florida is that you can't make a farm and make your own saltwater when you want to raise fish, right? You can't make, it's too expensive. So you need a source for seawater, so you got to pump it in. And so, but in Florida, the problem with that is that you need to you need to be able to get a pipe out there or collect seawater uh, seawater, and it's it's very difficult, right? And it's it's ten miles not, out, yeah, I'm not going to go out there with a, a thousand gallon truck and pump seawater in and back and forth. You need to be really on the coastline, but the coastline is too expensive. You know, it's. Uh, million dollar homes you know i can't put a hatchery out there i can't afford it right so, 
most of the farm to do a saltwater fish. It's a little bit in the Keys, but that's moving out. And it's going to be the Caribbeans and things like that, where they can, they, the laws are very minimal. You can just throw a pipe out there, pump the water in and out. And yeah. Whatever. Yeah, I went to Belize some years ago and consulted on a coral farm. And they were able to do it. But then the, the government took it over. They decided they wanted right. it well, for, their, yeah. for their state fisheries. Right. I mean, so it, it's really hard for me to bring, you know, any fish, you know, like it's really hard for me to bring a lot of fish and, and get into the numbers. And what happened is that I'm competing with the Far East, right? So if I breed something that's really popular, I'm competing Far East. So here I am trying to raise a fish in high numbers. But by the time, it's still cheaper than what I can produce it. And they even, you know, like by the time the fish out comes out of Singapore or whatever, or Hong Kong or you know, Thailand or whatever, when it comes through, even with the shipping, you know, it's still so cheap, right? And so right. I'm sitting here like producing a nice fish and uh, I can't compete with that price. So now I'm down to producing a fish that's not in the in the big chain store, but it's more like, you know, like semi-common, not like rare. And then, uh, then I can't, I, you know, I sell okay, but it's, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's more temperamental in sales. It's sometimes uh, if it's popular, it sells a lot. If it's, you know, goes to a downsize, then it's like, eh, you know, I went through that with the Africans, especially the Malawis when I used to work on farms and breed my own Malawis and peacocks yeah. and hops and all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, suddenly, in the span of five years, that fish was everywhere. Those fish were everywhere, right? Every farmer right. had them, every importer had them, every because they were so easy to raise. You just put these African in a nice pond and they mass produce, right? You know, yeah, that's and right. they sell big ones and all that. And then years ago, the uh, the, the feds, the U.S. Fed, fed tried to well, cut the uh, methyl testosterone in the food, so we couldn't. Uh, we couldn't get the turn these cichlids into males or coloring up like males, you know. So, which is what's happening in the, in Asia now is they yeah. they put it on the fit, and that's how you get these assorted peacocks or these giant sword tails that are all oh, male. Yeah. Uh, we can't do that here, so because we could produce really nice sword tails, but then you know most of them are females, so half of them are females. So, you know, a lot of time they end up on the ground because we can't get rid of them. You know, you get rid of some of them, but what do you do on forty thousand? Right. <laughs> right like, yeah so it, it's it's a commercial i mean it's a disposable item you know that's how you have to look at it you know perishable and disposable so farmers are always trying to find ways to to get an edge but it's very difficult here the cost of living cost of labors you know i mean you can go literally in asia and they you can you know have 20 people clean up a pond in a matter of hours sorted cleaned and everything else uh, we can't do that here you know the, our, our cost is too high so it takes us a little longer to clean a pond because we're only a few workers and stuff like that you know right yeah and the and the, the cost of labor but right well labor taxes food gas whatever you know? yeah right yeah right. it's everything it's not just when one. you're in, you're in a, a unique position where you are uh when you when you started your farm it was a little Kind of a corner of of an a, a, an ex urban area, and now is worth probably a hundred times more than when you bought it. Oh yeah, well that's the, that's the thing. Uh, I live, you know, I was in Sarasota, living downtown in the beginning, and I had a little hatchery in the house, you know, like a four car garage kind of thing. And then I, before that, I worked on a lot of different farms, and I did a lot of broking and stuff like that, but. And then I ended up buying a nice piece of land and that was literally cows and pastures all around. And now I have malls and shopping malls and, you know, Home Depot. Oh, it's and amazing. Isn't it? Yeah. And I've got a little, you know, a little plot of land with all my stuff. And yeah, I mean, I could sell tomorrow for good money, but then what, what, what do I do with my right. life? You know, I mean, right. I, I can exactly. stay here and buy another farm. I can't do it, you know? So, right. I, you know, and it, the cost is still high, you know, I still got, higher bills than most farmers, but at least, you know, I'm a little established. So right now I'm improving the facility and trying to find different things to do. I, I like to play, you know, a lot of guys don't like it. You know, there's a lot of purists out there, but 
I like to, to, to mess around with the fish and I do a lot of hybrids with, let's say, Synodonis or something like that. And I come up with all kinds of stuff that's really nice. And I, I start selling that stuff pretty good. You know, yeah, I can do the regular stuff, but I like to come up with fish. I like to do genetic work a little bit. Not necessarily like uh, gene splicing like they're doing with the glowfish or things like that, you know, like taking a, a, coral, gene, a coral gene or a, a, a jellyfish gene and put it into a fish because that's what glowfish is, right? So right. It's a, and so uh, that's a little bit extreme, but you know, it, yeah. it's one of those sellers that, you know, like you, you can't compete with, you know, like they, they come up with all these different colors and different fish. Exactly. Right. So, you know, and I can't, I don't have the facility to do that stuff. So I do the regular hybridizing stuff, you know, and you know, you guys are familiar with like uh, flower horns and things like that. Those are hybrids. I mean, who knows what's in the fish after five years, you know, I mean, so, and the people, they're real popular in the beginning, they weren't. And then suddenly now everybody wants them and, you know, they can't produce enough of them and everybody wants the big knuckle hump on them and all that stuff. So uh, I do the catfish and I'm, you know, I'm just playing around and, you know, stuff like that. But I do other stuff too, you know. So now what about some of the newer fish that are coming in like that, like the, uh, um, the, the garamis, the licorice garamis or that, that whole family of, of, of fish? The yeah, I mean, water stuff. yeah, that's that's a very specialized stuff. I mean, as soon as you get this, the warm water, the acidic water, really acidic, kind of that four four o or four or five or whatever, it's it's not like conducive to market for us as a breeder because it's really difficult to uh, to find a market. You know, yeah, we we can produce a little bit of it, but the market is definitely settled on you know like a really hardy you know seven five hard wow. water. You know, okay. it's a bit like uh, the shrimp, for example, shrimp is a good example is, uh, you know, the, let's say we talk about the, the neocardinias and the caridinas, you know, those, those two groups there. So, you know, everybody like, oh, you need to do the, the caridinas. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's great, but they're soft water, cold water, and a little bit acidic. And every time I can do them, that's not the problem. And I can do well with them, but it's when I sell them is a problem. And right. And, if the system, you know, the wholesaler or the store or even the customer doesn't have the right water, then they don't do well. And next thing you know, they get frustrated and, you know, where it dies. And, and then you're, you're trying to explain to them what they need to do. They don't have the, the knowledge or they don't have, you know, the expertise to figure out how to get their water acidic for the acidic and cool and whatever. So it, it, well, it becomes... Let's, let's like, talk about that a little bit. Because that came up earlier today. I, I look back and I realized I have not had a tank with a pH below seven in probably fifty years. There you go. <laughs> you answered your own right. question. <laughs> and and that's I think that's everybody's experience. Right. There are a range of fish, and you just mentioned one, the and I mentioned the other, that I really would like to be able to keep, but to do that. I've got to I've got to be able to take the hard water that's available to me, soften it, and maintain it at, at yeah. that lower pH. How do I do that? Uh, well, actually, that's 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 the hard way to do it. You know, like so. There's a rule that I follow: is that if you start doing chemistry to your water, right? And like acidic, putting acidity in your water, or putting you know like uh, chemicals in there to change the water chemistry, you're, 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 you're not doing it the right way. Right. right. So in, in order to really, you know, acidify the water, you need to find well, how does it get there? You know, what makes it acidic, you know, and, uh, you know, like, so if we have a basic rule is for example, uh, you, you know, let's say we're up North and we live in an area where it's really rocky and, uh, you know, like part limestone, limestone or whatever, so the rocks all over the place. So when the rain comes in, so let's assume that the rain is, let's not worry about acidic rain, but let's say the pH is like six, you know, or five, five, six, super soft, right? It's uh, soft water. It has a uh, acidity value in this, in the sense that it's, uh, it's corrosive, right? Acidic, uh, soft water is corrosive. So that's how we have to look at it. So it'll dissolve. Pretty much anything it could, it could be organic material or uh, rocks or whatever whatever it co comes in contact to will uh, 
the, the water itself will change chemistry, right? Because it's acidic, you know. So that's why we don't have, you know, we don't have um, soft water in our pipes, right? So that would be really, really bad because if you have copper pipe and you put acidic water in there, well, you'd be you'd be drinking copper. Maybe not a lot, but a little bit. But if you're living in that house and it's got copper pipe and you've been there for 20 years, well, yeah, you're not going to do too well. So, you know, we have to have hard water going through the pipes because it's stable, right? It's not corrosive in any way. But in nature, water coming out of the sky is corrosive. We don't see it that corrosive. It just goes down and it's water. But over time, it'll corrode whatever, right? It, it, it'll dissolve organic material. It'll dissolve rock. So when you have rainwater that comes through, you know, the rocks and all that, uh, then it becomes hard. Right, and it'll take the, the the pH of whatever mineral buffers it up. So, in the rainforest, for example, they don't have any hard material. You know, maybe in the mountains in Peru and things like that, and volcanic, then the water's harder. But when you go to the Amazonian basin and it's just organic material, when the water hits there, it just dissolves whatever's there, but it's all organic and it's just really acidic. Right, it just goes straight down to. 3.5 or something, 3.8 in certain areas, right? So that's what makes the acidity. And a lot of animals can't make it in there. A lot of fish do make it, but a lot of plants won't make it, right? You understand that the plants need, you know, certain minerals to assimilate. And if the water's too acidic, they can't assimilate that. So they don't live well. You'll have water on the plants on the surface and you'll have plants, you know, in the forest. But if the water is really acidic, you know, plants don't thrive, right? Aquatic plants. So, because it's corrosive, it's just it, it, it's, soft water is just too hard for them. It's a, the water takes away from the plant more than the plant can take from the water. That's how you have to look at it. So, you know, like to acidify water. So, if you, you basically, first of all, you got to soften it up. And then you got to decide what kind of pH you want to get. And then you, you work with that. So, one of the examples I tell all the time is let's say you have an African tank and your pH is. No, you don't have much limestone in there, but just regular gravel and stuff like that. And you got tap water in there. And what happens over time, if you don't do water change for a while, I'm sure people have seen that. But they, what they don't realize is the pH is going down, right? Over time, the pH will go down because you got, first of all, you got the, the animals in there releasing, you know, like waste and all that. But the, the main culprit from that is bacteria. So what happened is the bacteria that lives in your biological filtry, filtration is... Um, it requires things, nutrition to convert your, 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 your nitrates and, you know, your, your, your ammonia and nitrates, nitrites, all that kind of stuff. It needs, it needs certain ingredients. And the main ingredients that it uses to uh, convert these, uh, to, to feed itself on, you know, your fish waste is, uh, is carbonates, you know, not calcium carbonate, but carbonates, right? So, whatever you buffer your water with, right? Whatever the water comes out. So mo all water that comes out of the tap has carbonates. You know, that's what makes it, it buffers it up to seven, five or eight or whatever. So over time, you know, people see that they go, oh, my fish look better. Every time I do a water change, they spruce up. It's because the carbonates were gone. And so the fish really like that. And the pH was going down a little bit. But if you take a tank and you, the fish will start dying, you know, even though the water looks good, but it's because it becomes acidic. And so it's the, it's the bacteria that, that takes all the carbonates out and makes it acidic. It takes time, if, especially if the water's hard, it'll take some time. But if the water's soft, then it doesn't take long for the pH to go down and uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, livestock in the tank. So, and the main thing that the bacteria eats to uh, convert the ammonia, the nitrates, nitrites, all that stuff is, uh, is carbonates. So the trick to uh, to uh, to uh, to acidify water is the the bacteria converts all this stuff, the carbonic the carbonates into carbonic acid, and that's why the pH goes down. I can get my tanks down pH to three five. That's as low as you can get it with bacteria biological filtration, and wow. uh, have like conductivity or you know grains of one grain of hardness or whatever. And then, um, but you, in order for, to achieve that, you continuously have to put like a sprinkle of carbonates in the tank and then your pH will go down, right? And uh, your, your, your bacteria will feed and slowly get the pH down, right? But, it, but if you go past the 3.5, then ammonia kicks in because there's not enough food. So ammonia goes back up and then 
then you have a whole slew of issues to deal with, right? So you can't just start putting carbonates in there. Your pH is going to spike, ammonia is going to become toxic, and your fish are not going to be happy. Anyway, so that's the gist of it. You know, I mean, I could be more in detail one day to explain you how to do it, but that's that's the base the base of it. Well, I really want to be able to keep these uh, um, these garamis, the the licorice species of garamis, the samurais. And I've right. had them a number of times. I've had them. They are being bred in captivity now. So yeah, but they're, they're, they're big producers, right? I mean, I've bred, them, I've bred them quite a bit, but they're not producers. I mean, even though they're temperamental, they're small. The males is the one holding the the brood and all that. So right. it's 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 a cool fish. I mean, it's a hobby fish, right? It's it's great for hobbyists. Right. right? It's right. a challenge. It's a really big challenge, right? They're small fish. They 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 breed good if you feed them more mostly live food. They don't do well with dry food if you want to breed them. They like that pH around four or five. Yes, that's for sure. Maybe five. And then, uh, you know, dark tanks because they're very shy. You know, we all know that these fish are so shy. They don't like uh, they don't like the movements around them. So uh, that's another thing that, you know, as a breeder, you know, fish tanks are not made to be a, a breeder because fish don't like to be looked at, you know, when they're breeding. Right. They don't like that. You know, we, we tend to want that because we want the television look of like, oh, we want to see the fish. But Technically, a breeder doesn't like to have, you know, the tanks with lots of windows. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just looking. I'm, I'm following the following the chat here. Uh, they're all into their own little thing. <laughs> yeah, just, right. just pick one. Uh, yeah, let's see. What a three. <laughs> if right. there is a question, maybe, maybe I'm boring. Well, Corey's. How about Corey's? Talk about Corey's a little bit. Well, in terms of what? Like, that's a, a Corey's a big, big well, word. Like, uh, um, well, we're talking about, we're talking about salt or water. What about the, 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 the pH requirements of Corey's? That's kind of wide ranging, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But, you know, there's a misconception on a lot of people thinking that fish only breed in the water they're born with, which is not really true. The big issue in breeding fish is what does the egg require to, to be viable, yeah. right? Huh. So you could breed discus in hard water, right? And, right. But the hatching is a different story. Right. So they will breed in hard water hot, but the eggs aren't going to hatch. And people are out there putting, you know, methylene blue and, you know, all kinds of little concoctions to prevent fungus, you know, or the, 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 like. but the, the big issue with eggs and that happens to Corys and all that kind of stuff, you know, angels, Cory, discus, uh, any kind of soft water fish, sort of soft water, even some of the barbs and all that. So the, 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 the thing is that, the thing that people have to understand is that when you have, let's say, just the angelfish, that's an easy one. Angelfish, they breed all the time, right? And people always wonder, how come all the eggs turn white and all that stuff? And I'm going to put medication on them and stuff like that. And the first question I ask them is, is what kind of water you have? And most of them are going to say, well, hard water comes out of the tap. And, okay, what's the pH? Okay, 8. Okay, uh, what's your hardness? Okay, it's, it's up there, you know, 15 degrees or whatever it is. And then next thing you know, it says, well, that's your problem. It's not, it's not the eggs. It's not the fungus. It's not that. It's the fact that a membrane, the membrane of the eggs, all eggs pretty much, is negatively charged, right? So it's negative because it wants to assimilate food and minerals and all that. It's, it's a breathing membrane, right? There's an exchange between the two. It's not just a seal like a, like a you know, and it's, it's, a, it's an open membrane. So elements go back and forth but in order for it to be active it needs to be negative so element go towards it right so it could be minerals could be oxygen could be whatever so what happened is that if you have hard water and these fish are, are bred or like they, they live in soft water then there's no calcium in that water there's other things but there's no calcium there's no magnesium so the first thing that happened is the eggs the eggs get clogged so the calcium just start binding to the membrane that's what makes it turn white that's what makes it go hazy 
And basically, the egg is still alive, but it dies because basically you just sealed it and it's over, right? The the, the embryo is not going to make it without huh. oxygen and, or you know whatever else it needs. So the thing to do is to soften the water, right? So, but you cannot soften it in the middle of the process. So let's say right. your angel fish, let's say your angel fish just laid the eggs, and you say, well, I'm just going to wait till tomorrow. Well, that's too late. So it's mostly like they lay the eggs, you pull the eggs out. And then you put them in soft water and then you're okay. But if you wait a couple hours, that's pretty much over. You know, some of them are going to hatch, but the majority are probably not going to hatch because the calcium is already binded, right? Or calcium oh. and magnesium or whatever other minerals you got in there that are positively charged in the water are going to go. So mm -hmm. that's actually, that's how it works, right? So uh, uh, you can like strip spawn these fish. You know, a lot of, a lot of people can spawn, strip spawn with hormones, but as soon as the fish can be grown in hard water, and get all fat and everything else. But then when you're squeezing in the eggs, you put in the eggs directly in soft water, right? So, and then you're good to go, right? So that's that's usually the key. So we, yeah, we can, can, can a fish, can any fish be adapted, a fish living in soft acid water, be adapted to living in hard alkaline water? Yes, yes. Takes time. A good example is cardinal tetra, right? So, you know, like uh, I did a lot of cardinals. I used on cardinal tetra extensively. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, That's, breeding is not it's not, a, it's not a hard fish to do. It's an egg scatterer, you know, you know, what doesn't matter. So the thing with the cardinal is that it'll breed in any water, but the eggs are so small and so brittle that, you know, you, you can't really collect them and move them into soft water when they breed so they have to be bred in soft water but the the the, 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 the like i say they're not hard to breed but the, the the thing is that you can breed the cardinal you know I do, I do all my stuff in soft water so i breed them in soft water but the ones that i sell for the market i have to adapt i can't sell a cardinal that's in 4.5 water you know one degree right. of hardness or one grain of hardness and but you're hacking them out in that right yeah I'm growing them up in that too because they grow well in that. And then, uh, but I also grow them I slowly, like the first three weeks, they grow in soft water. And then I slowly wean them out and grow them in hard water. Right. And then, then, then I sell them as hard water. But I can't sell a cardinal that's been growing in, in pH of four and expect the distributor or customer to do well with it when I, they jump it into pH of eight you know, or seven five. Right. Yeah. So you can adapt and stuff. They're just not going to breed. Well, they will breed, but nothing's going to happen, right? Are they going to be healthy? Does it they're affect gonna their health? They're going to be healthy. The, the biggest problem there is is that the, the, the wild ones, when they come in, they uh, they go from these really acidic ponds, right? Because they collect it in the, they collect cardinal in the dry season. They don't collect them in the rainy season, right? They come in the dry season when these cardinals are in like four inches of water, you know, that kind of stuff. And the water's been sitting there for three months. So acidic pH of about three and a half. They haven't eaten in probably a couple months. They're just sitting there in little skinny things. And then they bring them up and then they, they, they you know, millions of them. And then they, uh, they put them in hard water because that's all they got. And then they, they don't do too well because they're not, first they're not, they're starving. And then uh, there's an adaptation period. So the way to do it is to bring them in soft water, not just RO water, but RO water acidified, like really soft. And acidic and then you 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 know probably take care of them for a couple of weeks to a month you can feed them up fatten them up and then slowly wean them up to the hard water in a couple of weeks it's a big process and very few people do it because it's too much work and it's not worth it so they tend to just get the cardinal and they live but sell them right so that's yeah. how, that's yeah. why that's why the majority don't make it because they just they never had the adapt adaptation period to do it you know huh So if you breed um, uh, a half million cardinals in a year, how do you market them? So how to market them? <laughs> send list to people. <laughs> send yeah. list. You know, send a lot of lists and, you know, wholesale. But, you know, one of the things is, is a lot of people think that when you're a breeder, you just press the button and the fish come out. And no, it doesn't work that way. When I get a fish going, it takes me two years. 
it's a two year process, right? First of all, you don't go, it's not like I can go back my stock at 7 Eleven and say, okay, I need a, a full one, uh, you know, 4,000 breeders of this fish and I'm going to have them producing. And then six months later, I've got them. So, no, so no, you're no. spending a year building breeding stuff. Yeah. Well, the first year is basically depending on what the fish is. You know, some fish are a little harder, depending on the, it depends on where the stock's at. And so you have to build stock, right? I can't, 100 fish is not going to get me anywhere. Right. It's, it's just the beginning. It's great to have wild stock. Yeah. But then you take that hundred, you, 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 you get them all nice and healthy. You breed them. Then you get the, the babies the way you want them. You grow them up. You pick the best ones out of those. You don't pick all of them. And then yeah, you grow, you know, four or 5,000, get them all ready. And then you start working with them. Right. And so, and then you breed them, grow them up. And then, you know, so you, most of the time as a producer, when you do a fish, it's two years. It takes you two years to get your return on them. So there's a lot of work involved into building stocks. It's not like, oh, I got a pair of angelfish and I'll start making a lot of money. <laughs> it's not going to work that way. Yeah, I got one pair. I need 40 pairs, right, of that specific strain or whatever, right? And uh, th then you can get going, you know, because when you start selling, it's like it's like selling potatoes to McDonald's. You can't tell them you run out, you know. They're going to go look at you or they're going to go find somebody else. Right. And they're right. not coming back to you. They're not coming back because I, I can't rely on this guy, you know. So yeah. when you produce high numbers, you need you need to be reliable. The worst thing that happens is the fish get bigger <laughs> and then you sell them for you know a few pennies more or 10 cents more or 20 cents, whatever. So, you know, it's not the end of the world, but you know, you need to have the stock on hand so that they can re depend on you for their marketing. You know, you're you're not the one dealing with the marketing, they're the one trying to sell the stuff and make their business go on. So you, you need to be there for them. So you can't, you know, can't say, well, I got them right now, but yeah, we'll have them next month. I said, why? Uh, because you don't feel like it. That's not working. <laughs> right. Right. So it's, it's not just a matter of, it's a matter of developing a, a system then that's going to be able to be productive year after year. Right. And, yeah, the, the other thing that people say, well, just buy fish from somebody else. Yeah, you could do that. The, pro, the the challenge that you have when you buy a fish from somebody else is that you don't know where they come from. And right. you inherit all his problems, right? So whatever food or disease or, you know, genetic issues he's got or, you know, whatever resistance the fish has lost, uh, you know, you're dealing with his stock. It's not your stock. Right. So you can go out there and buy stock from another farmer, but you're inheriting, inheriting his problems. Right. So the best way to be a breeder is to get your own stock and build it. Right. So it could take a while. It could take a while. Right. I remember doing um, black veil angels for a while, you know, and a lot of people say, oh, I got to get some. So I get some veils and I get some blacks and I work them out and I get some wild fish you know, some more Peruvian angels and cross them over and trying to get a nice body, nice finish, straight fins, long fins, you know, delta tails, all that stuff. And, and it took me three years, you know, to get stuck. And, and then when I had stock, I didn't have one pair. I had, what, 75 pairs going, right, of black wow. bales, right? It wasn't like, oh, now I got something to work with, you know, and some of them, you know, even when you breed that after a while, they're not that strong and they don't grow that well. And, that some of the fins are crooked and you know whatever you know so you, you, you you're not necessarily producing 100 percent perfect fish right but you're trying you, what you're selling is the good stuff right you're trying to go and say hey these are you know really really cool right so i'm going to sell this stock you know and, and then you you go through them yourself and you pick the best of the best for your breeders and then you keep on going you know so for those of you who are just coming in well we're talking with andres ryan is the owner of Bioaquatics, one of the one of the the best selected breeders in the country. He's, well, I don't uh, know about that. You know. hey, come on, no, that's I'm not just, too this guy in my in my hatchery doing my own thing. You know? Right, <laughs> his uh, his, yeah. his store is linked on our uh, fatherfish.fish uh, website as Bioaquatics, and you can. Go into his store. He has. I'm getting a shipment from him this week. I guess you're going to ship out tomorrow. Well, I can't ship tomorrow. Yeah, I'm going to do tomorrow, but I can't ship tomorrow because it's President Day. <laughs> I can't. Do it. Nothing's going out tomorrow. It's holiday. 
Uh, UPS is open. UPS Zoom? I'll have to check. Okay, well, yeah, I, they are. I I'll check. See. They are. Okay. I know FedEx is not. So post office is not. <laughs> yeah. Well, post office. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, FedEx. I'm getting fish this week, I guess. Bro, yeah. So, yeah. I'll get you some fish. I'll get you. Yeah, I'm excited I'll, about that. Looking I'll forward go to out that. There and scoop out of the tanks and see what's there. We'll, we'll have a bunch of new fish to show off. Right. Right. There you go. Really. I appreciate you coming up, Ryan. No worries. Well, I'm you always happy if you want me to, <laughs> if I don't bother you. you. Yeah, mate. Uh, right. It would work right. for me if it could be like on a regular, like in a regular set time or set day or something like that. Because I kind of got a schedule and I can squeeze Sunday's oh. always good. Sunday's always good. Saturday be a little tough, but Sunday's good. And then uh, stuff like that. So anybody else got questions? <laughs> Let's see. Oh, well, we know. I don't know if you need to go. You need to go. Yeah. Can I use light for the rest? Uh, let's see. You know, we, we well, Chad and George and we got people saying thank you. Nice to meet you. The guy is energized. Um, uh, interesting to think that all fish originally came from the wild, even flower horns and goldfish. Well, not flower horns and not most goldfish. They didn't actually come from that's the a, wild. That's a different story. <laughs> that's funny, isn't it? There's wild yeah. fish into not that. their current configuration, anyway. Right. No, no, it's, I mean, there's no, you know, it's a hobby, right? It's still a hobby for me in my own way. I'm not a big guy. Right. I don't know how to decorate tanks. I'm not a big aquascaping guy. Um, you know, I can I produce plants, but I barely know how to deal with them when it comes to setting them on a fish tank or something like that. And I just the, the challenge. My my favorite part is to get a fish and trying to breed it and trying to see if it could be commercial viable. You know, the right. key, key word is there commercially. Not just say somebody, like, saying, somebody yeah. asking you if you breed Oscars. The McColgy. Yeah. Do you know what the McColgy is? Oscar? I don't know what that is. I'm not familiar with that one. You know? Yeah. Uh, you bred Oscars, certainly, but oh, yeah. By the kind of a big fish to handle. Yeah. yeah, it's a yeah. It's yeah, it's Oscars. <laughs> they breed in the canals in Florida and they can breed right. in the and they breed in tanks. They're not that hard to do. Now, most of these fish, they just like live food. You got to give them the live food to get them kicking over, and then they start breeding. Uh, Tom, don't breed really well. They don't the breed really well. The bioaquatic site is if you go to fatherfish.fish, the bioaquatic site is linked, listed there, or bioaquatics.com. Right. That'll get you there. Yeah, I don't have much. I mean, I have a bit of stuff, and you know, I just play around with some stuff and, but it changes it, you know, and then I'm, I'm expanding right now. I'm kind of low on angels. So I'm trying to get back in breeding, but I had to rebuild the hatchery and build more tanks. So I put in another like 32. Victor uh, wants to know if you make your own fish food. Uh, there's a good topic, fish food. And I you, make some of you make things with fish food. Yeah, I make some of it. I buy some of it, but at one point you're going to, you know, like, it's like time, right? Time is money. And so in the past, they used to make a lot more fish food. But over the years, commercially, there's some commercially available food that are really, really good. And there's there's no point making food. Yeah, I can do additions. I can add some oils to it or vitamins or different fibers and stuff, whatever I need to do to the food to make it a little bit more palatable for the fish. Not necessarily, be, you know, a lot of the foods out there are very good for the fish. It's just... The thing that's more important than anything else is the attractants, right? So you can you can have a really big meal, right? Like can say you make yourself some really healthy food for yourself. It may not be very palatable or very appealing to you because it doesn't taste right. It doesn't mean it's bad for you. So the biggest thing with fish is their their taste bud and their smell. So huh. you have to have what they call attractants in the food, and that's the key. Right. So I may go out there and find a really good food, but the fish don't really like it. It doesn't mean the food is bad. It just means that 
it, it, it doesn't interest them, right? But if you start putting like shrimp oil in there or some kind of fish oil or some kind of like specific, there's some certain spices, then the, then the food becomes really attractive and they eat it, huh. you know, and then it's good for them. So that's what I do. I try to find food that are really good and to have, you know, specific ratios of fats and oil and fibers and whatever. And then I, you know, and, and the, the main ingredients are healthy ingredients. Like I stay away from the soy stuff and the corn. There's no corn and there's no soy in the nature, right? So those are proteins. Right. Protein in fish and, and oils that don't the fish can't really process, even though we think it can, they don't. So you, you, if you give them a food that's high protein, but the protein comes from soy, or most of it, you're going to have a lot more fish waste than you need. Right? Huh. So your filtration is going to work overdrive, and you're going to end up doing more water change in your tank because the fish is not processing that protein. So you got to get protein that they can process. You got to have fats that they can process. You can have fiber that they can process. So the ingredients themselves are important. Sometimes the ingredients are great, but if there are no attractant in the food, like specific smells and flavors, then they're not going to eat it. So that's where the, the thing is. So a lot of the foods out there is the reverse. A lot of the commercial food, like in the stores, all you know, the flake foods and all that, what's the made the food is made out is crappy, but they put attractants in there. Huh. So the fish eat it, right? They go, oh, it tastes great. It's like eating a bag of chips. <laughs> Doritos right, and stuff. Right. It's great. I mean, it's good for you, right? So right. it's cheap to make. So oh, real commercial food, good food for us is expensive, may not have the attractants, but then you put the attractants that you feel, you know, the fish will like. And some fish like certain and the fish likes others, right? So well, how about a brand name? You want to do you want to do a brand name? Well, you know, one of the brands I like the most is uh, Otohimi, or it's basically just a Japanese brand. Yeah, that's, I've been selling that in my shop. Right, so I've been using a lot of that, you know, and then I use a lot of Aquamax for myself for the for growth and for maintenance, and then wow. Otohimi for conditioning, and then frozen foods. I don't do a lot of live food unless it's for breeders, but live food I usually make my own. Uh, I hatch my own brine, grow my own brine shrimp. Um, I don't do blood worms live. I don't like worms, live worms anyways. Uh, I could do earthworms, but that's too much work. So um, a lot of the foods I do frozen. And then uh, let's, say, uh, let's say I do guppies. I do a lot of guppies. So I feed a lot of guppies to some of the breeders and it's all my guppies. It's, uh, uh -huh. it's not guppies coming out of someone else's pond or some ditches or a store. It's my own stock, right? So right. I know what it's been eating and I, you know, I know it's clean. <laughs> So yeah. your life food is important for sure, for sure, you know, and uh, frozen food's good. And again, it has to be quality stuff. And I don't do much with blood worms or frozen blood worms or black worms. Uh, I never had good luck with it. I always had, you know, secondary problems with those, those, those items, huh. uh, you know, because of the, yeah, it's okay once in a while, I guess. But if you want to be a producer and you want to really get, you can't, you know, like, Black worms for me was great in the sense that if, if if they're fresh and they're clean and you had them in the bucket for a while, for aerated for a while and they're clean, that's good. But most of the time you get them and they're, you know, they're dying or they're sick, they're, rough. Or yeah. they're rotten. You know, if they're not going to, fish ain't going to like that. They're going to eat it, but they're going to, eh, you know, you may create other problems later. And then it creates water problems, right? Yeah. It's not worth it. I'm curious when here. Uh, this may be a throwaway. Mike says, can you ask him if he knows anything about a fourth parachyridon neon tetra discovered in 2006, but yet to be described from Rio Perus? Which one is that one? I need a picture. <laughs> I, yeah, right, exactly. I don't I did, know. The, only, the, the only tetra, the last tetra I played with was the red laser tetra. You know, so which was I can't remember the name, and it's the bright red one, right? That's a oh, right, yeah, that's a stunning fish, it's a stunning fish. And I, right. there's a few guys that bred, they're not hard to do. Uh, the problem is they don't color up unless they're adults. So the, the, the red laser tetra was the only one I can remember that was the newest tetra. I haven't seen the others. Uh, there's so many tetras being farmed and produced, and uh, so uh, you know. That's the market. It's a volume market, right? And uh, the red laser was the one I was interested in. I did it for a while. I had a few thousand, but the problem I stopped doing them because the 
the, when they were small, you know, like everything else, a little, you know, like in one inch stuff, they were just a brown fish, you know, and yeah. there was no color to it. And it took me a year, grow them up for a year to get something, some little males. And then you get the females are brown. So the males are like neon red, like blood red with the black fins and, you know, bright eyes and all that. But the red laser, that was the problem is that it's, it didn't look like anything. You know when they're small, oh. they only look, and they, and then they only look great when they're in breeding. When they were not in breeding, right. they were okay, right. but they weren't great. You know, yeah. it's like a like in, unless you, like it's very different. Let's say we look at a like a cardinal tetra or a neon tetra, even if they're like a quarter inch long, they got the line on them. You know, the blue line. If they get a half an inch, they got red on them. You know, so you know it's hard to compete with that kind of tetra, and then even stuff like lemon tetras and and you know, serpy tetras and stuff. They're red even when they're tiny. Right, so there's a market value there. So, uh, Chad Gardens wants to know if temperature affects the male-female relation uh, ratio in fry. Uh, well, which fish are we talking about? Way. It uh, may affect okay. some fish, but most of the most of the time, no. You know. Huh. Mm -hmm. The two things that will affect the ratio is pH and food. Huh. So, like the quantity of food that you feed the babies will determine a lot of time if they're going to be majority male and majority females. So the food is a big issue. Huh. So, for example, for example, on live bears, and that's a really well known fact that if you feed, like when they're born and baby, and you're power feeding, you're going to get mostly females huh. because the female required food, and then since there's a lot of food genetically imprinted into them and the, well, in the genetic they uh they know that oh because there's a lot of food i'm going to turn into a female because i'm going to be able to have babies and there'll be plenty of food for the babies to continue but huh. if you don't feed them a lot majority turns into male but the problem huh. is for us they that's don't, interesting they right. Don't, right well if, what happens you get a pond full of sword tails and you don't feed them you know the babies that are going to come out are going to be mostly males but they're going to be small really small right they're not going to be like three inches they're going to be like one uh, inch yeah, yeah. Right? So, yeah because you're not feeding them but they're males same with guppies and things like that so so it's the problem is is the more food you feed but you want them to feed them anyway you're trying to grow them up to sell them you want to get some meat on them but if you you know you end up with majority females because you're power feeding right to grow you don't need to sit on the fish for a year to sell you want to sell it in three months or at most two months yeah, right right uh, let's see uh hemogram is Corellia, the red laser yeah red laser yeah. gorgeous fish it's one of my favorite but you know it was like eh could do anything with it. Do you have any now? No, that was about three years ago. Uh, I could probably get them again. I got a couple of farmers that have some. You know. Oh, They're, they they like to play with them because it's such a bright red fish. You know. Right, right. They're good size too. That's a good three inch. Oh, really? It's a bit like yeah. It, it reminds me of like the Congo tetra or something like that. Oh yeah. It's a good size fish. That's the same problem with the congrues, I guess, isn't it? It's a really stunning fish, but but it takes a year to grow them out. Also, well, the rainbows. Saying, they're not hard to breed. I've bred tons of those things, but the problem is, is that nobody wants them at an inch. Everybody right. wants them at three inch, and they, they take your body a year to grow. Same and thing with the rainbow. There's not enough. The return is not good enough on them. Right, right. Wonderful fish. Oh yeah, you got the Congo, you got the yellow Congo. There's three of them, if I remember. Three, three different ones. Uh, have you done much with rainbows? Yep. Another fish that grows too slow, and there's only right, one. Right, exactly. Farm. Yeah, I mean, right. they don't look like anything at an inch or two inches, and it's uh, the, the biggest producer of rainbows is Valley Fisheries. You know, here in you know not far from yeah. here, and they. Yeah. Uh, but they do everything in ponds. So they have like hundreds, maybe thousands of ponds, big, you know, 50 foot or 100 foot ponds. They grow them up for years, 
you know, a year, probably a year, I'd say a year. So they breed a fish and they sit in the pond for a year and they have big ones, you know, three, four inch stuff, you know, and right. I can't compete with that. <laughs> I don't have right. to face right. that. Yeah, I could breed Millennium Rainbows and Bozamanis and there's a whole bunch of them. But the problem is, is that they're, I can sell them at an inch, but everybody wants them at three to four inches fully colored. I don't have that. You know, I can't exactly. grow them for a year. I can't do it. I don't Mike have space. Mike is asking, what's the safest live food to feed? in terms of pests, parasites, disease, and other issues. He wants to know a good quality live food. That you want to make yourself or you want to buy? Well, there you go. You're talking about frozen. That probably is the safest. Yeah, but that's not live food. The safest live food, I would say, you know, probably mohina. Yeah, baby. Yeah, Moena. Right. The problem with brine shrimp, like if you hatch brine shrimp, is a vibrio bacteria. So what happened is, it, like, vibrio bacteria will come from the, the older brine shrimp. Like, let's say you've been feeding brine shrimp, you've been you hatch your own brine shrimp, yeah. but it's a little old, right? It's a little old. There's still some left in there, but it's been there an extra day or two. You have bacteria growing in there, and it's vibrio bacteria. Huh. Most of the time, the fish will do fine with it, right? But if the fish is stressed already and your water's not right, and then you feed that, you may end up with a bacterial problem and your fish gets sick, right? And wow. it's pretty virulent, wow. right? It's pretty hard on the fish. So Vibrio is the problem with brine shrimp that's been a little older. So for me, I hatched a brine shrimp, and the minute I'd done with it, even if some left over, I cleaned that up, bleach it, start all over. I don't even let it sit for an extra day trying to get the rest of it. It's not working because oh. of the oh. chance of getting a vibrio in your bacteria in the fish is, is, you know, it's bad. Right. And when yeah, it, yeah. it happens, it's just like wildfire, you know, and it's going to happen on most of the time it's going to be on your baby fish because you're feeding brine shrimp, baby brine. And that's when it's the problem. And it's it. the little fish are, are not making and a lot of people lose fish because they feed them older, newly hatched brine shrimp that's been sitting in the jar a little too long. So Daphnia. Yeah, Daphnia is pretty clean because if they, they the, the thing I like about Daphnia basically is that uh, if the conditions aren't right, it stops breeding and it dies. So it's not like it's right. It's pretty the range of which it does health is good water quality. The key to the Mohina or what we call Daphnia is uh, water quality. So itself, the animal will die if the conditions aren't right and the conditions to be right have to be really clean water healthy plenty of food in the water and if the water conditions go bad it just dies so it's kind of a good indicator to tell you to feed the fish to feed the animal or not right so plant lady wants to know some good tips for raising daphnia green water warm bucket of water on the side of a window <laughs> You know how to do that. I'm sure, that. I'm sure you right. got a video somewhere or you got a couple of tips on how to do that, Lou. You bet. You bet. Yeah, that's your that's your expertise. Funny stuff. You remember Doc's Moena culture? Yeah. He had that culture Lord knows how many decades. Oh, yeah, you keep rotating it around, keep moving into another tank or whatever, a bucket, container, you know. Just got to get it the right, you know, get it to know your, know your, your, know yourself, <laughs> know what you're doing. Right, 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 right. Nice. Well, we're at seven o'clock. Yeah, I know. I was just looking at the time. I've been there for an hour. Sorry about yeah. that. I didn't mean to be. I appreciate uh, it. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, did you Thank take it? so much. Yeah. 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 Pardon? Oh. Did you tape this, or this is, is this is just a live feed, and that's it? Well, we'll no, it's taped as well. So oh, okay. we'll we'll pull we'll pull some uh, some videos off of it and shave. I didn't shave. I didn't work. I've been working. <laughs> yeah. I got I'm not finished. I'm not done working. I got a bunch of stuff to do and stuff. Well, we'll get you up again in your in your barn. 
that's fine. Yeah, I got plenty of I got plenty of internet over there. Yeah, exactly. I'm right now, I'm putting more tanks up. I'm putting a bunch of big tanks, uh, big 300 gallon tanks. Put a dozen of those in. To, to do what? To grow, grow more animals. Grow, not breed, but grow. I need grow. It's grow bit. out, huh? Yeah, catfish, angels, tetras, whatever I can put my hand. Galaxies, you know. What kind of what kind of catfish? Uh, right now it's mostly Cynodonis. I got a lot of multipunctata, so a lot of petrocolas and some hybrids. Those are the big ones yeah. right now. And then uh, I work on other stuff. And then, uh, yeah, I don't do plecos right now. Uh, you know, I, I try to find my niche, you know, find stuff that, that works. And I do rotation for a few years. I'll do something. I'll put it on the back burner and do something else. But I can't do everything. It's not possible. You know, I can only do certain items, you know. Right. The big one for me is, uh, you know, in terms of volume, shrimp, angels, catfish, those are the big numbers. And then uh, I'm trying to get back into cardinals right now. I'm doing, I'm building up stock for galaxies. So I'm saving thousands of young ones for, for future breeders. So, uh, yeah, things like that, you know. Ryan Oaks is asking about mosquito larvae as fish food. It's It's okay. It's good. It's just a, it's pain in the ass. That's why I don't do it. <laughs> yeah, it's not hard to do. It's not hard to do. It also it also does they don't occur in a high water quality environment. It's right, low water quality. It's, different animal. it's an insect, right? It's an insect, so it's a different thing. And right. uh, my biggest problem with that is not that it's not nutritious. It's really good, right? But it's the the problem is is a. Like the way to do it, the way I do it is I line up a bunch of buckets uh, outside, you know, and then I put, uh, I cut a orange in half and I throw it in there, right? And then so it's orange. I throw an orange in the bucket, in the bottom of the uh, half an orange in the bucket. I'll oh. cut it in the, you know, in quarters or whatever, but about half an orange into a bucket of water, and then uh, I let it acidify, I let it spoil, and then I'll start picking up the uh, the boats, right? The mosquito boats, the little Little yeah. egg cases, the egg cases. Like boats, little black things. So the yeah. egg cases. So I'll sit there and get a little net, scoop them up the surface, and put those into another bucket. You know, that's also old, and let those guys hatch. And then you get like millions of them hatching, and then you feed it all at once. But my biggest huh. issue, with mosquito, is not the feeding. Is that wherever I put it in the tanks, if they don't get eaten, they hatch into right. mosquitoes. So next thing you know, right. I'm week of, of feeding this stuff then i have hundreds of mosquitoes in the hatchery or whatever because i they didn't all the fish didn't eat it or i put some in the fish that, that, that you know that they didn't need them all right so and then you're walking around with mosquitoes in the building and it's like annoying so i don't do that too much you know right so, yeah it is a downside no question Fish can do without it for me. <laughs> right, right. Let's see where we are here. A guy, uh, uh, R.C. Savage said he just got a black worm culture and they disappeared into the gravel. Is, is that normal? Well, yeah, they don't would, like the light. I would say that's normal. They don't like light. They're going to hide from light. They're going to go right, away from right, light. Right, right, right. Yeah, they don't want to get eaten. <laughs> They don't, right, they don't want to get eaten, exactly. Crickets, talking, sorry, talking about crickets. That's a pain in the butt. They're not hard to do either, but the crickets, I mean, the only time I used crickets is, was when I was doing, a, a, I had a big tank with uh, with uh, archer fish. Oh, you know? uh, really? Oh, uh, um, yeah. Do you ever spawn archers? Well, I tried to, and I worked on it, but it's so hard. It's a, it's, I could get the eggs, but they were never ready. And the oh. fish had to be a good size, you know, an old, right. three years old. Yeah. And um, it, it's a brackish water fish. So there's, so oh. the challenge with that fish is it, it would, it would live in, in, in freshwater estuarine areas. And the babies, the, 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 the eggs would, drift down into the ocean and so in order ah. for the eggs to hatch they'd have to be salt water wow you know and so it becomes very complicated it's the same story with um what's the name of that um 
a mono shrimp, a mono shrimp. So I bred a mono That's shrimp right. before. Yeah. So mono shrimp, it's not a hard animal to do. The thing is, is it's a, it's a brackish animal, right? So it, it comes, to, well, so it's in a river. It, it goes up and it's a, you know, scavenger, eats algae, whatever. So but the thing is it breed, it'll breed in freshwater, right? But the eggs won't live very long. But as soon as they hatch, they live for literally 18 oh. hours, maybe 20 hours, and oh. then they die. So the way to do it is uh, the way, you know, it's like you breed them in cages, right? And then the babies swim in the cage with the shrimp. And then the minute they breed, you take the cage, you lift the babies out of the cage, you know, they're in the cage, and you move the cage into salt water, literally. Huh. Move right. them right away. And then they do well. But what happened is it's a pelagic larvae. I don't know if people understand what pelagic means, but it's a swimming larvae. It's not a shrimp yet. It's like it's right. And it swims around. It's really, really small. And then the transfer into salt water makes it turn it into shrimp. And they, within a couple of weeks, they start settling down to the bottom and turning into shrimp. And those little baby shrimp, they, they climb up and they smell the fresh water and they slowly move up the bottom oh, of the ocean right, right into yeah. this fresh water. Oh. So that's the key right there. You know, that's the problem. Yeah. They're not they're not hard to do if you do the technique and you just really work on it. But it's a lot of it's it's a uh, labor intensive. <laughs> Smart man. Amazing. Uh, I'm just looking to see what else is going on here in their chat. A pisto. What's some tips on breeding a pisto Borelli? Soft the water. Umbrella, the umbrella cichlid? Yeah, soft water, warm. Remove so. male after spawn or kick them in? All right. Okay. So, okay. So um, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to say this one. Pairs of fish have to learn to take care of their their fry. Ah, right. I'll get back to the angels. It may take an angel pair five or six, ten spawns to become good parents. Huh. If you keep pulling the eggs. They never good. They never become parents, and there is a window where these fish learn to become good parents. And when they're young, for some reason, I don't know what it is, they have to learn how to be parents within a certain time frame of their life, like two or three spawnings, or maybe more. But what I'm saying, within the first year of breeding or two years, okay. of the first yeah. year of breeding, they become parents. In order for a fish to become parents, you may have to suffer and see many spawns go bad. Many huh. spawns not go bad, but hatch, disappear, hatch, disappear, hatch, three babies swim around for a while, disappear. Then, you know, then the process goes back and forth, right? Because these two fish, male and female, have to learn to take care of little ones. Huh. They don't know how to do that. You know, they just have the instinct to learn and the instinct to do it. But they, you know, I've seen, I'm sure you've seen that. You've, you've got a pair of fish, they breed, there's a bunch of babies in oh, the yeah. tank. And then suddenly you decide to move a rock, disturb stuff, take another fish out, to come back the next day and the babies are gone. And it, they ate their, their own fry. They just, you know, just the way it is, right? So, uh, so a lot of people will go and get breeders from somebody else. Yeah, you get big fish from the wild and you're trying to breed them and it's like, they're not, it's not working, right? They're, they're breeding, but they're not taking care of the young and all this stuff. And a lot of times they just, they, they, they don't have the right partner. They don't have the right, you know, conditions and all that stuff. So when you got a baby fish that you grew yourself and you're trying to, to, to get it to become a good parent, you may have to suffer and see many spawns go bad before they become good parents. So it all depends what you want to do. If you want to be a commercial thing, then you go out there and you pull the eggs and you hatch them and you say, screw it. I'm going to take them out as soon as they breed and hatch them myself and do the work. Right. So, but if you want 
the joy of seeing a cichlid raise the young and defend it and get their full color and you know this defend their territories they might take more than one spawn to get to see that right so the best way to breed a pistos it, 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 there's two questions there's two answers it's do you want it to do it because you want fry and just sell them mm. or you want to do it so that you can see the behavior and see their vibrant colors right right courtship, right and courtship what do you want to do right so if you want to see courtship you may have to figure out a way for it to for them to become good parents and raise their own fry so which means you may have too much light on there and the fish are too stressed so they hatch but then they're too stressed they eat their fries so you may have to dim the light you may have to put more plants you may have to take some of the fish out if you have a community fish tank you know, there's a bunch of things that you're going to have to do and try and that's a trial and error thing so and maybe after three spawns everything's fine right and so uh, that's it's a it's a very personal questions in a sense if what do you want to do that's what it comes right. down to right so, yeah. and you may you you may find out that that pair is no good they may never become good parents and then you, you have another pair on the side and they're good parents and you don't know why and it's just well they've learned it differently so that's how i look at it nice i had um uh, some triple reds i got they spawned and i got a lot of fry let them in the tank at 29 about 20 25 fish in there never got another spawn but all of those all of those grew up so there was too much too much stress right intraspecies for them to be able to for any two to be able to pair off and spawn again right and there's many things that you have to experiment with it could be the size of the pipe it could be the color of the pipe it could be the depth of the pipe when they breed that you could be putting flower pots in there and they don't they, they, even though they're laying eggs and you're like oh they're doing great but they don't that's not what they want right so you may end up changing the pipe and it's a darker pipe and it's a deeper pipe and they do great right so then so it's a very uh, timid fish so they don't like a lot of activity you know how they are they look like they're you know in stress they're sitting there like with their little fins and yeah, like, exactly like right. hopping around and like looking at everything and as soon as they're right. shadow like whoop, they're darting out and you know they, yeah. they just go when it's quiet so and they like certain vither fish so they like stuff that not necessarily crazy fish but some calm fish that's at the surface that gets them feel like okay he's okay up there so i'm okay down here right that kind of stuff so that's the yeah, security is the big issue with the pistol yep, because they're small and they're so they're like right. how do you say high stressed high strung high strung fish high strung, yeah right somebody said oh funny comment guppies will just breed no parenting needed would you care to respond to that <laughs> nothing to say there you're right yeah. <laughs> You're right. They just need a hiding place, it's you know. Babies out, need to... right. Funny. Libraries. How often the guppies spawn? Daily. Well. Well, it depends. What about, you know. what about monthly? Huh? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 continuously, basically. They may have some spikes here and there, but, you know. Right. You know, if you have a lot of plants and hiding place, you'll have babies in the tank anywhere. But if you don't have any hiding place, that's a different story. Right. Huh. It's a strange question. I don't know what he's getting at. We ever had to deal with uh, he's he's using the word mafia or M A I F I A. But part oh catchment areas in california oh he's not in california we don't have that issue in florida uh i don't understand what, what was the question i didn't understand i didn't get it really do you get it yes. explain it john okay so you've got fish coming in from asia apparently there's some, some mafia involvement with the distribution importation so if you're competing against them is the mafia bother and oh, said, there's no mafia. There's no fish mafia in Florida. 
there's not the Asian. Okay, person. right. It's yeah. Look, it, 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 this the guy is asking it is in California, uh, and I guess there's an issue with importing as opposed to local distributors in in uh, in California or local farmers in California. Okay. Right. No, we don't not, have much. In not dealing with that issue in Florida. No, we're farmers, you know, we're breeders. We just get stock and if, if you know right. you grow and breed it and you go from there, you know. And you know yeah, there's oh, always issues. For it. example, all local fish stores in Los Angeles are from Southeast Asia. Yeah. Right. Well, Southeast Asia, Thailand, and yeah, Singapore. It's a totally different environment here. Totally yeah, different on the east. The East Coast is not like that. No. <laughs> it's a completely but it's, there's no thing, farms. The East Coast is like much food. more yeah, it's more there's established. No there's no farms in California raising tropical fish. You know, they don't have water. They, they, it's it's just a it's they may right. have a couple of you know, people with bats and tanks and stuff like that, but right. you don't have the numbers. They don't have the numbers that we have here. You know, I mean, they don't have a farm here. Like we have a couple of farms here in Florida producing neons, right? And maybe three, right. maybe four, but on average, they do a hundred thousand neons a week. People don't understand the numbers. One hundred thousand neons a week. I mean, you don't have a farm in California doing those numbers. No, right. guarantee you yeah. that. There's no, they don't have a water. <laughs> they don't can't do it, you know. So everything in California is imported. As soon as you're imported, you get issues. I mean, I, if I try to get fish from Africa, it's a pain, right? I I may send money over there. I may never see the fish, right? So yeah, there's issues for importing fish for sure. Doesn't matter if it's from Nigeria, yeah. or Africa, or you know, India, or you know, Southeast Southeast Asia. You have to have really good connections, you know, and, you know, reputable brokers and things like that to bring sick fish in. And I used to get into that a lot, but I stopped because it was too much work. I'll pay the extra dollar or $2 or $5 of fish to make sure that I look at it in the tank. Okay. It looks good. I'll take it, you know, then trying to get it directly from the source. Right. So right, I can right. get fish from an house. I can get fish from the house or, you know, Panama or Costa Rica, or whatever I want to get some some, some centrals, but first of all, I'm not sure I'm going to get the fish. Second of all, I'm not sure I'm going to get I'm going to get my monies out of it, right? So if I give the guy, I say, oh, I got a guy down there. Okay, here's five thousand dollars. I may never see the money again, and I may never see fish again, right? For sure, there's issues right. with that. Yeah. Yeah. There's no control, right? You're just taking a guy's worth. So I'd rather deal with the big distributors that bring in fish once in a while. Maybe once a year I'll see the fish, but at least I'll see it. Is it worth buying? Yeah. Healthy? Is there males and females? Uh, is the is it really what I'm looking for? Yeah. And then I'll, I'll buy it. Yeah, I'll get it. Sure. But to, to take the chance of importing stuff, it's not what it used to be. That's for sure. Uh, I've got a question here that's interesting. Is there anything you feel there is a gap in the market for? breeding wise that you think will do well right now or that will always do well no matter what strange question i don't even know how to get at it well it depends on you know well there's there's a like like and i can, give you, I can give you a fish that you can always sell that's for sure and that's the Stuffy. way that's Angel. the way you have to look at it so right 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 i would say the the let me see. Let me name you a couple here. I'd say number one, probably guppies. Right. You couldn't come up with enough guppies, right? Because most of the guppies coming into this country from the Far East, nobody breeds them. Very Either few people. Fan, so you name it. Right. You name it. Any color, guppies will always sell. They'll always sell. Uh, yeah, okay. You get females and males, but guppies will always sell. You got a good strain of black Moscow, you know, the pigeon reds, uh, whatever color you think of, lemons and yellows and cobras, and they don't always sell, always. You, you, there isn't a fish store in the country that's going to say, hey, you got some good looking guppies? I'm not, I don't want them. Every store will take them. Yeah. Uh, they always sell, right? They're not expensive. Let's not get kidding away. But, you know, you could set up a colony of guppies and let's say you're producing a thousand guppies a month. 
you can easily make a thousand dollars a month out of a thousand guppies. Right. So, yeah, you're not going to get five bucks a piece, so you're not going to get twenty dollars a piece. Right. And another one is betas. Yeah. Betas, right. is, it's crazy, crazy numbers, right? So, just to give you an idea, betas, right? So, let's say a big distributor here, they bring in about twenty-five thousand betas a week. Oh, I know. So, not 2,500, right? 25,000 to 35,000 right. betas a week, and they don't have enough. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, they're a couple of bucks. The price went up on them. You know, you get the dragon scales and you get all the oddball stuff and the different finage and half moons and crown tails and all that kind of stuff. And it, it, it's, it's crazy, right? Yeah, some of them aren't great looking, but. Overall, they always sell. And if you're a really maniac on it and you decide to pick a really like a tricolor and really work at it with dragon scales, it doesn't matter if it's a half moon or delta tail or crown tail or whatever it is, <laughs> they always sell. Yeah. So, you know, so on the other side, you could say, well, I want to do zebra plicos. Yeah. Yeah. You can do zebra plicos. I played with them. But how many are you going to sell? Right, you're gonna go out right. there. And you're gonna produce ten, five, at a hundred bucks a pop wholesale. Even if that's one hundred fifty dollars a pop, right? You're not gonna produce them all the time. They're temperamental. You lose a lot of them. They they're they're picky at their food. They're picky at breeding. They they don't hatch great. Whatever the story is. Yeah, they're one hundred fifty bucks, two hundred dollars a piece. But you're not gonna. You, even if you had a thousand of them, you wouldn't sell a thousand a month. It's not possible. Nobody's right. got that money. Right. Right. That's right. it. You you just. It, yeah, it, it looks good. It's a pipe dream. It looks great, you know. So I used to do a lot of plecos. I did the gold nuggets, and I played with zebra plecos and stuff like that. And I got rid of them because there was just no market for that stuff in terms of money. It was just a, the money is into like the the turnaround, common fish, sword tails always sell, guppies, bettas, angelfish. Good looking angelfish sell, especially yeah. blacks, koi, red ones, you know. They, they always sell. Yeah, they, they sell great. Everybody breeds silver angels. Yeah, they're silver. Yeah, okay. But if you start getting some really nice marbles or some nice blues, they'll sell. You know, so it, it, it depends, you know, it depends. But it, there's a there's a price break, right? So, I mean, to me, guppies, sure. Bettas, sure, you know. So, so why are you not doing bettas? Uh, I, I did for a while. I just don't have the time. <laughs> I'd rather do something else. Can't do everything. The time because they are time consuming? Not so much. The thing with bettas is they're easy to breed and grow off is easy. You grow them up like anything else in large numbers. You can put thousands of bettas in the big tank and grow them up. And then and as they get older, you pick the best ones and you put them in a, in a little jar somewhere. And so that they look at each other and they get the males grow their fins and that takes about 30 days. So you can grow them up for two or three months, get them really big or two months, not even as a community. And then when the males are starting to show a really good color, like a, like an inch and a quarter or something like that, inch and a half, then you put them in a jar or a little cup so they can see each other. And then they're, they display and then they get their fins bigger as they display, as they grow, they get their fins bigger. So they get the nice big flowing fins from the, the you know the fighting between each other you know so right and keeping them in the yeah, 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 from chewing up right. yeah to me to me it's a good uh, hobbyist fish right right it's, right. A, it's a good hobbyist fish to do in a garage you know and you set a bunch of cups and then you sell them for five to ten bucks yeah people yep. come over you put them on a little you know, Facebook or whatever, any Instagram, whatever you're trying, whatever platform you have. And yeah, it's fun to do. Stores, it really local is. Stores, local stores, you know, whatever, you know. Somebody wants to know what you think of glowfish. You mentioned it earlier. Hey, it's probably 5D is the one that got the monopoly on that fish because they're the one that got from uh, Spectrum, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah. The thing with that fish is it's a uh, it's a Walmart item. Right. So the thing about that is pe people don't understand the volume that these guys go through. It's millions of dollars. I mean, it's it's millions of dollars. I'm not shitting you. 
it's millions of dollars. So <laughs> to me, if I had that kind of money, I would say it doesn't matter to me, you know, like, so it's, it's a monopoly fish, right? The, the, the thing with that fish is that I can't raise it. I'm not allowed to raise it. And the reason that's how it works is this. And that's why you're not seeing that fish out of Asia either. They may have it out of a, they may have it in Asia, but they can't sell it in the U S right. so it's a GMO fish, how you want to look at it. But the main way they did this, and the guy was a genius on that, is that they have the patent on the fish. That's right. It's not the fish that they have the patent on. It's on the process. The process of how to get the gene into the fish. So yeah. they patent the process. So no matter what I do, I can't change the process you know unless i start my own thing my own company in genetic work and do a new process i cannot use their fish because their fish the process is in their fish they know how they did it they, they patent the process so i can't touch that fish i can buy the glow fish at their price and resell it that i can do but i cannot breed it on my own and sell it right and they're really really stingy about that they they check everybody like if if i get on the list to sell that fish i gotta sign a contract i gotta get inspected i gotta get there's a whole slew of rules right and they know how many fish i got and they know how many got sold and they know how many you know what i mean they check everything right ah. so, then it's a it is what it is <laughs> genetic big change they're probably not available to some of your right let's see been going for an hour and a half dude <laughs> right now uh, just looking to see if there's another question here so so we're down to what like four guys listening to us <laughs> no actually you have 136 oh really okay we're still okay, I guess. We hold it up pretty well, yeah. Just about two more Julie, uh, Julie Corey's and three pygmy. I was doing Corey, uh, you know, a lot of interest in Corey's. Yeah, Corey's yeah. not hard to do, it's just got to get them the right water and they breed all the time. Uh, it, it, it depends on. It's it, it's it's basically it, again. It comes down to: do you want to be commercially that stuff, or you want to do it for for fun, <laughs> right? So, the, 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 like I breed Corys. Like I, I did a lot of pygmies a few years ago just for fun because uh, I like the fish. They're like, like microscopic, you know, like yeah, yeah. And uh, the way I did those, I did really well with those, is in cages. So I'd have a big cage with a screen, like a fish tank fish tank and then I put a cage in the tank and the breeders in there with little plants and things like that and what would happen is that they would breed in there all the time but the babies as soon as they would hatch they would fall through the screen and lay at wow. the bottom of the tank so I would uh, maybe leave the fish in there for let them breed for about two weeks maybe and then every two weeks I would take the cage and move it to the next tank over and then let the babies grow in the tank you know and I would do hundreds, hundreds like that. You know. Huh? What'd you feed the babies? Uh, the, a couple of things. So I'm really, I'm a big fan of banana peels. That's just uh, for me. So if you a guys, what? Banana? Banana, banana peels, the peel. Really? Right. Yeah. So what I do is uh, you guys are familiar with paramecium and stuff like that. Sure. So I do paramecium for rams and, you know, pistos and, and, Corys and, and not Corys, but uh, like uh, Cardinal Tetras and you know things like that. So what I do, and Pond Loaches too. So what I do is I'll, uh, when there's babies hatching in the tank, I'll put strips of banana peels in the bottom of the tank. Well, they'll float first and they sink and they turn black, but they cover themselves with microfauna. You know, wow. so I don't understand what microfauna is. It's a microorganism yeah, yeah. and yeah. they live on that. And the we're, fish we're big on microfauna around here. Right. And they live off of that. Right. Oh. And it's high fiber. It's got protein in there. It's got all kinds. Of, so basically the baby fish will feed off of that. That it's baby catfish, baby quarries, baby turtles. And the peel gets black. Right. So as it goes, and fish, baby fish are attracted to black. 
because they feel safe. It's like a shadow, right? Okay. So, like, uh, like if I put a peel in there and I put a zucchini in there, it gets the same result in terms of microfauna, but the, right. the, but the zucchini is white and the banana peel is black. The huh. fish will go on the black. They huh. won't go on the white. Fascinating. That's a good one. That's a good one. I do that all the time. Huh. And then you go on the brine shrimp and everything else after that. Right, right. Uh, Rope Sanders talking about your hair melting. It's uh, that's the background. You can't. Yeah, it's the background. Right. Funny. I like that. That's good. Let's see. Oh, do you age the banana peel first? Or just put them in straight. Put them in straight, and then over to, over a week or so, four or five days, it starts sinking to the bottom. Somebody said the banana peels work for iridescent sharks. Yep. That'll work. Iridescent sharks. Mm -hmm. Now that's a fish that has to be really big to spawn, I would assume. Yeah, I got it from my friend. Uh, John here at the Golden Pond raises them. They're what, like the three, four foot long? His breeders are three, yeah, maybe four foot long, three and a half. Big fish, big fish. Yeah, Very cool fish. Yeah, it's a, it's a Bangassius cat, you know. It's yeah, a big, right. Big, massive catfish. Probably really good to eat, I would bet. Yeah, sure. Heavy. Heavy bodied. Mm -hmm. Can you feed pineapple? Acidic stuff is not great, you know, and it's got some acidic, kind of yeah, up. right, right. Yeah, it's like it's like lemons, oranges. I don't know much about it. the only time I use oranges, like I say, was when I do mosquito larvae. Right. Well, banana peels work for guppies. Well, it'll work for anything. It'll work for anything. Does it foul the water? Mm -mm. <clears throat> if there's a filtration in the tank, it won't foul the water. But if it's in a, if in the, if it's in a bucket and you're trying to get paramecium, yeah, it'll turn white and then you'll have paramecium. But and then you'll have to just decant the water out of it and feed that to your fish. Right, right. So you could get a paramecium culture that would be too dense to maintain itself. Right, and after that, yeah. if you spoil it and you get rid of it, start another yeah, one. Spoil, yeah, right. Oh, nice. Well, we got a couple of, uh, let's see, chat. I don't know if I can find this. Go to the bottom here. This, this chat is miles long. I'll never get to the end of it. We can do them another day too, you know. Right. Broccoli tree. So any kind of uh, vegetable matter is not going to foul a tank. Is that right? Unless it's in yeah, most of extraordinary them. volume. No. Fouling water is going to have to be oily and fishy or it's going to have to be meat. Right. 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 Like excess food, excess frozen food. You know? Right, right, exactly. Dead fish. <laughs> but rotten, but plant leaves dying is not going to foul the water. Or any, <laughs> or if you put lettuce in there, any kind of vegetable matter is mm -hmm. not going to foul the water. It breaks down and gets consumed by microfauna. Right. And bacteria and fungus and whatever. Right. Let's try and get this. Somebody made a $10 donation here. And I wanted to try to get it up, and I can't I can't get to the end of it. Right. And I'm going to have to go soon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it awesome. I got to get going. Well, the answer one more here. Got it. 
Shad Garden and LA. Louisiana or is it LA, California? <laughs> uh, I guess it's California. Thank okay. you, Chad, very much for the $10 donation. That's very kind. Who says Judy Two Moons is here? Lloyd Goodyear, garlic fresher powder for him. Fresh, always fresh. Uh, never, never jarred, never dry. Well, dried, I don't know. Yeah, not dried garlic, fresh garlic, fresh, fresh smashed garlic. Treat it as a food, not even the, the liquid, like garlic juice. Don't use that either. Treat it as a food. Its value is, is, is as a food. It, it, when it gets eaten, it, it can help clarify the gut for, uh, for fish that have internal bacteria or whatever. Garlic is, uh, garlic is an attractant. A lot of fish do like it as a taste. So right. it's added to the feed to make it more uh, palatable. Ah. In terms of nutritional value, it's more the smell oh. than anything else that the fish uh -huh. like. What about its antibacterial properties? Mm -hmm. Antibacterial. Yeah, it, does have that. it does have that, but it has to be in high dosage. <laughs> you know, like yeah, it's uh, clove of garlic in a tank is not going to do much. You know? Right. But what about eating it for internal, like internal parasites or bacteria? I don't think it's, well, it might, it might affect bacteria for sure. I don't know about parasites, but if bacteria, yes, it might affect them. But Okay. Anything you put into a fish, you have to be careful because every fish has good bacteria in cell in the gut, right? Ah. So you can't just destroy any kind of like bacteria. So one of the thing about like for example, uh, a classic one is uh, plecos. So one of the big thing for import plecos, let's say the wild caught stuff, and let's say we be more specific on the uh, L numbers. You guys familiar with L numbers? You know, mm. L46 is a zebra, you know, right? L81 is the gold nuggets, you know, stuff like that. So, um, the thing with a lot of the wild plecos, and it's something that you know people don't know, but you know, this is something we know because that's how we deal with them is that they, when they go out there and collect them, they don't collect hundreds of them at once, they get like two here, four here, they don't get anything for a week, they get a few more, they get a few yeah. more. And they collect enough of them to make a shipment worth, right? Sometimes these fish in there haven't eaten, and I'm not kidding you, for over a month. They haven't eaten oh. any. They're skinny. They're they're just haven't eaten. Their, their body still looks good, you know. What you'll notice is the eye sunken in. Yeah, so you're going with it. The eye sunken. In. So when you get these plecos in, you look at them. They got the eye sunken in. So that means they've been really starved, and they may be full body, but then when you roll them over, they're all concave you know they got hole of guts the worst thing you can do when you get those fish in is feed them it's the worst thing you can do because they have no bacteria in their gut and the first thing that will happen is they will eat like crazy and then the food inside their butt their belly will rot and they will die and it happens wow. all the time so the trick that we had and i've worked on it it's very easy it's it's kind of crazy but it, it worked is before I get the fish in, I would get these big plecos I have around, those big regular plecos, you know. The big wild plecos. Yeah, the wild plecos, whatever. I got to love them. And I put them in those tanks that those plecos are going to go in, that the wild ones are going to go in. And I put these big plecos in there, and I let them let go in there. I put, I leave them in there for like a week with the sponge filter and everything, in, and they're going to crap the tank out. They're going to make a nice bacteria film in there. And then I move them out. And then I put the wild plecos in there. And the wild plecos will go in there and they'll suck up the bottom and suck up all that bacteria. I won't feed them. And I'm not going to feed them for a week, at least, and let them maybe five days. And I won't feed them. I usually do a week. I won't feed them for a week, but they'll live in the tank with bacteria that's been from the gut of another pleco. And what happened is that suddenly those fish are coming back alive, right? And then a week later, then I start feeding them. And then I don't have any losses. Nobody dies. Ah. So I'm re-putting new bacterial fauna in there. Right. All 
All right, one more. <laughs> I gotta one go. One more. All right. Love you guys, but I gotta go. Let's see what we got here. Team fish before I add name fish. Uh, one more question, guys. See what you can come up with here. What fish did he give up? Oh, okay. John's got a good one. What what fish have you ever given up on? Have you ever? Is there one? I'm thinking. I'd almost be surprised if there were. I'm thinking. Fish. Well, if archer fish. <laughs> I just, I archer. Just, I just, uh, I love the fish. I just couldn't, you know. It, I don't even know if I gave up on it. I just like I maybe they weren't old enough, but you know, I kind of like lost interest. You know, um, it it was just a, like. Probably it's not that I, I didn't want to quit on it. It's just that I think the biggest thing is research sometimes doesn't make any money, right? So I could sit there and keep at it. And at one point I got to say, well, I got other things I need to do, right? You know, I got to make a living somewhere. I can't, there's a certain amount of my time that's not going to be right. not going to be well spent. It's not like if I still had them and, you know, I had, you know, a bit of money saved away and stuff, I'd, I'd still play with them and figure it out. I would figure it out. You know, I would try. It might take me 10 years or whatever. But the, 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 but there's there's a few fish like that. You know, there's certain catfish, you know, and there's certain, like, like char they're like the archer fish. Well, right. Mullet. There are other fish like leaf fish that. Yeah, leaf fish, I think, is really be, fairly, fairly easy. I mean, it's not like. Uh, it's not like you're you're dealing with uh, different environment, different waters, and migrating right. fish. Or right. something like that. that fish lives in a leaf or in a, it's not a migratory fish. It's not a fish that's going to, you know, right. a bunch. Of, it's probably the leaf fish is probably related to a specific chemical in the water, specific time of year where there's food available and hiding places. There's a bunch of things, and when you start uh, like narrow it down, it should be that hard, right? Uh huh. Like, yeah, you know. I, mean, I mean, that's researching, but you're, you're depending on field observation as well to be able yeah. to do that research. Yeah, it's, it's almost like being curious, right? You, you look at it, you check it out, you read about it, you, you talk to other hobbyists and you, you see what they had to say and who's familiar with the fish. And, and then you go on instinct and you try things, trial and error, right? That's what life is for. Right. Right. You, you, life is not exciting unless you make mistakes. <laughs> the only way to only way to learn, isn't it? Yeah, but it's also interesting, right? If you try something and right, yeah. Work out, yeah, you so, it. so you know it's like <laughs> you, could, you could play it safe all your life and be in your comfort zone, or you could be in the non comfort zone and figure it out. Right. Okay. We got it. How many people we got in here, John? 130. 130. We've been right at that mark the whole time. Oh, oh really? Well, that's good. Make a huge oh, thing. Of... Yeah, right. Ah, very good. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Andre. Well, you're welcome. Nice to have you guys uh, invite me over. Hopefully, I didn't get you guys too boring. <laughs> well, got cool. well, I think everybody was real excited to have you. Been getting a lot of very positive i should i should read this stuff to you but it would just embarrass you damn yeah, I'm, I'm good i'm good <laughs> i'm good yeah. i just look look it's it's very simple for me i i i i not a big you know i try to do a bit of youtube video i got one i'm going to do one today again and but it's a uh, you know i like to do my stuff i don't mind sharing Sharing is not a problem, but I don't, I'm not a big, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm 58 years old. You know, I haven't, I'm not in the YouTube thing and I'm not, in, I do a bit of Instagram and stuff, but it's not my thing. You're doing more YouTube stuff than I've ever even think about. Yeah, you know? yeah. So I, I like to spend time in the hatchery. I, mean, I would like to do other stuff too. You know, I, I, I train basketball players and a lot of guys in the GBs and stuff like that too. So I, I do other things too. And uh, you're also a stargazer. Yeah, I got a telescope outside. And yeah, I like fishing. I don't eat a lot of fish though, but I like the fishing part. Don't you? I like diving. 
you know, I mean, I haven't traveled a lot because I'm always on the hatchery. That's the big thing is when you have livestock, it's it's hard to just leave, you know. And this year is a different year because I've, I've, I'm a little off my off my comfort chair because my kids finally left. So I got all my kids out of the house. So uh, which yeah. is good, you know, which yeah. is good. It's just but it's kind of like lonely. <laughs> I, I'm going to read you a couple of these. Thanks for the show. Um, thanks, Bioaquatics. Thanks, Andre. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for the show. Bagpipes for our sake. It's been a great live stream. Wife loves pure white mollies. Thank you for all the info. Hope you come back again. One of the best streams. Thank you. Great video. Uh, may the force be with you. Yeah. Uh, I loved it. Wasn't boring at all. Great stream as always. Excellent stream. And on and on and on. Right. Awesome. Interesting. Great. Come back for another episode. Yeah, just let me know. And if you have a, if you want to be more on a specific topic or something, you could probably get like a little. That would be fun to do. Yeah. Like a, not a scenario, but like a, like little bullet points or something. And we can just go down the list. Yeah. I uh, should I should tell everyone. I used whenever I needed a speaker at 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 our Venice club meetings, um, I and, and was having trouble getting anyone. I would get I would call Andre up, and he would come over, no agenda, no nothing, stand up in front and throw questions at him, and it would be the most amazing meeting all the time. Every time. It was just yeah, remarkable. I would throw some pictures there, right? I'd have some pictures or something, a little slideshow or something. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I mean, that's whatever right. I got lying around, you know. I got yeah. lots of film and lots of pictures. I just don't have anybody to sort them. You so, did bring it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I got. Yeah, that's you did bring pictures. I got so, much stuff. I got so much stuff. And yeah. From, from clown loach breeding to cardinal breeding to freaking zebra breeding. I got so much stuff on video. I just don't have, you know, it's just, you know, I got hard drives full of this stuff and I just, yeah. I do, I go through a little bit of it, but it's, it's like, I went through some stuff today because I'm putting a little video together for YouTube. I try to do a little video out every Sunday for a bit of marketing, trying to get my site going a little bit more. And, right. uh, you know, I, I kind of dedicate, you know, one Sunday, like once a week Sunday, I put one video out. So I, I, I go through the, the computer uh -huh. and I, put a bunch of cards in there and I look around and then I go, okay, I'll do a video with that, you know, or then I just put them sit there for two hours, get a bunch of cuts and slap something together for two minutes or whatever I need to do. And then just do some, uh, yeah, like I say, I, I, I'm learning this stuff, you know, I'm learning to do the YouTube stuff and I'm learning to, to be more marketing oriented on the web, but it, it just doesn't come easy for me. Uh, cause I get scatterbrained and, uh, you know, I don't have a plan or like, uh, what am I doing? Right. You know? Right. Right. So, uh, um, somebody was asking about your link, bioaquatics.com or go to fatherfish.fish and you'll, you'll find the link there. Right. And I got a bioaquatics YouTube channel and then, uh, it it's all the same. And then, uh, I got a Facebook page too, bioaquatics. All that stuff. I got Instagram, bioaquatics, you know, same thing. And uh, right, right. You, you got some nice pictures and videos on there, you know, and uh, I try to figure stuff out. <laughs> we'll do a couple of videos on this. I'm sure I'll get my editor working on it and see if we can pull a few things out. Maybe some, uh, some shorts would be good because you've covered a number of topics that we could do as as yeah, sure. I, don't know if I, I don't know if I look great out there. I'm just like, you know, <laughs> I'm working all day. So, well, you know, he, he usually will dress it up with pictures of fish or something. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, we are, we are at the witching hour. We've been here two hours. Thank you, Andre. Love you, Come Andre. Andre. Thank you so much. I'm glad you're doing all this stuff. It's awesome. Good for you. <laughs> Both Amen. of you. <laughs> well, guys, thanks for popping in and being part of our our uh, uh, our show this evening. Um, make sure to check out some videos. Get over to the store. Check out the Andres Bio Aquatics. 
You can buy from him. He does ship out. Yeah. And, and, and feel nice free to, uh, what I was going to say is, uh, you know, I, I don't answer the phone because I'm too busy, but I, I don't have problem answering emails. So if you have questions or you're looking for something or you have something you want to ask, I'd be gladly, gladly answer you back. You know, so if you email me through the site, it's not a problem. I'll get to you. Might might be a day or two, but I'll get to you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, Andre. You're welcome, Lou. It's always Thanks. good to see Thanks, you. Guys. Hang in there a minute.